So in this video, we'll be showing you clips from five different videos from our pre-scene analysis pack. And the first clip is from the pre-scene analysis series. It's vital that you fully analyze your pre-scene, and this requires a detailed examination of the case study, ensuring that every section is fully understood. So our pre-scene analysis video provides a page-by-page -page analysis of every section of the pre-scene, and it ensures you don't miss anything important, and it helps you to build a comprehensive understanding of the material. And this is vital if you're going to gain high marks in the exam. So in this clip, we've taken a section from our pre-scene analysis video series. This is a company called Safewell, and it is a company that offers advice and support on corporate security and enterprise risk management. So as I've already said, these are key P3 topics. In fact, there are several sections of the P3 syllabus dedicated to enterprise risk management and COSO methodology and all those different syllabus content from P3 that specifically relates to integrating risk management throughout an organization. It's not just a case of putting in a very, very specific solution to a very specific risk. It's about making risk management part of the fabric, part of the makeup of your entire company. And in addition to enterprise risk management, of course, cybersecurity is now a key part of the SEMA P3 syllabus and indeed an important part of everyday business life. And we can see here that it does go on to talk about cyber risks and how the company exists to provide consultancy services for advising them on these sorts of risks, but also including intelligence and investigations required to address these threats and evolving threats as well. So one of the positives there that we can read into is that a lot of the services that we be provided will be on an ongoing basis. It won't be a case of a company pays us to, uh, to do X, Y, Z, and the contract's closed and they move on. It's ongoing business as well. So that's very good for the sustainability and the cash flow of the organization. But it does also mean that a lot of resources will be tied up into ongoing contracts. And that can make it difficult to take on new business, but it can also be problematic if there are perhaps issues with payment terms where an organization isn't paying their contract, etc. If a lot of resources have been invested into fulfilling that contract, particularly if there are certain payment terms that require certain activities to be completed before payment takes place. And so how do we, in a sense, manage our cash flow during that situation if we were investing a lot of resources and we're not due to be paid for a particular contract for several months, for example, but there's lots of people that are involved and there's lots of software that needs to be paid for, etc. So that's both a, a good thing and a bad thing there. So what we're also reading into there is the cash flow and ensuring consistent cash flow might be a potential issue for the organization. And also, given the nature of uh, the likely customers of an organization like this, they're likely to be quite sizable clients. An individual is not going to be uh, working with a security company to provide uh, security systems uh, for their house, for example. You're not going to employ a, a massive company like, and I've got some real world companies here, 4GS or Securitas, etc., to come round to install a uh, camera doorbell for you, for example, because there are plenty of other organizations that do those sorts of things, smaller organizations or smaller scale organizations, or you can do it individually. So the clients are likely to be quite large, therefore they're going to have buyer power, etc. They're going to be key clients, key partners for us as an organization. That also brings on to uh, staff being a uh, important stakeholder, both for ourselves, because of course we need to have uh, consultants to go in uh, to advise on these security threats. For physical security, we're going to need security guards, etc. And also the staff at 
the clients as well. If we are, for example, providing physical security, security guards for a bank, for a business, etc., then the staff who work at that bank, at that business, are going to be affected by our operations as well. We wouldn't want to be in a situation where we're getting calls from the managing directors of uh, the uh, businesses that we partner with saying that your security team are harassing our staff when they're coming into the building, etc. And as a quoted organization, we're naturally going to have shareholders as well who will expect a return on their investment. And just to pivot back to the real world company, just in case you did want to do a bit more research outside on the actual sorts of organizations that do this sort of thing in real life. Got some big ones there, such as 4GS, Securitas, and also Pinkerton as well. Pinkerton, one of the oldest security companies in the world. You may have heard of uh, Pinkerton from uh, in various different American films, and it was it very much came out and uh, started to get large at the, the turn of the last century when the FBI was founded as well. So uh, there's a lot of history for an organization like that. And uh, on the subject of being a, a large quoted company, I've also put that as a strength if we're starting to, to sort of think about strengths that we have as an organization, if we're building a SWOT listed company is uh, very useful. Now it's useful for raising additional funding through equity funding, If you, particularly if you want to raise large amounts of funding to uh, fund new strategies, expansions, etc. But it also helps with the prestige of the organization and the size of the organization. Now, larger companies naturally have a larger market presence. That's how they got to be so big. But there's also a degree of stability and security perception with that. If you are looking to uh, go and work for an organization, a large, long-standing company is going to appear to be more prestigious. It's going to appear to have more job security than perhaps a startup where you don't know if it's going to even exist in a year's time. So that helps with uh, attracting clients. It helps with attracting staff as well. So having a sizable market presence is also very useful as a strong thing for the organization. The fact that it is fairly diversified. Now, of course, we don't know for definite at this point because we are going to go through it page by page. But the fact that it is at this point already mentioning quite a few services that are provided means that it is quite diversified compared to, say, if it just did one thing. If it just said we offer advice and support on enterprise risk management and it didn't say anything else, we might be looking at that and thinking, is that all they do? Is that there a case for diversifying to ensure they're reducing the risk of something happening to that market? If there is another competitor that is taking more and more business in enterprise risk management, at least we've got other services we can provide. So it's already giving us quite a, a list of things here. We've got enterprise risk management. We've got consultancy on the, uh, counter security threats for physical, counter security threats for cyber, provision for investigations into addressing evolving threats, lots of different services that, that we can provide at this point. So on to us, who are we? Where do we sit within this organization? Well, we are a senior manager working in SafeWells at Finance Function. We are reporting directly to the board and we advise on special projects and strategic matters. And of course, this has been given to you in the preamble by SEMA about what the organization does. But it's a very important statement there because you have probably sat your operational case study, your management case study, where you were more involved with the operations of the business. Whereas we are sitting outside, a bit more outside of the operations of the business. We're in the finance function, we're a senior manager, and we're advising on these sorts of matters to the board and the senior management team. So when you think back to your E3, your E2 as well, with regards to advising on projects, to being influential, that's a very key point I'm going to come back to many times over this video analysis, is being influential and providing advice, providing recommendations. A key exam tip here is to always provide advice and recommendations, even if you are not specifically asked to give one in your question at least tie your answers off with a paragraph or so of recommendation 
and uh, how we take this forward. And of course, if you are expected to give one, then you need to be putting a lot more than that. But even if it's just a question which doesn't appear to be asking for advice or a recommendation, always have some form of summary conclusion with your take on how or how this will impact the business because being influential is very, very important. It's one of the key things the examiners and the marker are looking for. And what I would add to that is that as the strategic case study is a combination of E3, P3 and F3, that when you are answering questions, you also need to think about the, the resourcing and the sourcing of finance for anything that you're suggesting and the risks of anything that you are suggesting as well. Things cannot be viewed completely in a vacuum. You need to, when you are giving advice, you need to consider the risks and the impact of the advice that you're giving, or if it is going to require a significant amount of investment, a significant amount of resource allocation, how are we going to feasibly implement what you're suggesting with regards to those resource and funding requirements. Next up, we've got a clip from our strategic analysis. It's extremely important that you have the ability to identify how the pre-scene relates to key models and theory. And the examiners will expect students to demonstrate a good understanding of the models and theories and make the appropriate links to the case study during the exam. It can be hard to fully analyze a company using models you've only recently learned and be confident that you've got it right. So our strategic analysis has done that hard work for you. So in this clip, we're going to take a look at our strategic analysis video. So we'll start by looking at the mission, the overarching mission of the organization and uh, how we should define our mission, define our vision and our values based on what is known as the Campbell's mission statement model, because that's what a mission should be. It's what is this organization? What is Safewell all about? Why does it exist? What is its purpose for existing? And that's really important that we have that established because that provides a common purpose for all involved within the organization. The companies that you work for probably have missions. Well, I'm sure they do have missions. They have visions, they have values, things that you are expected to adhere to when you are working as an employee of that organization. And without that common purpose, then the organization tends to drift into multiple different areas, multiple different directions without a coherent strategy behind it. They need to have at least one general common purpose that we're working towards. And that should be any strategy, anything the company does, any of the operations of the organization needs to be checked against that mission. Is this ultimately moving us forward towards achieving that common purpose? That's ultimately what a mission should be about. And that's what you should talk about in your exam. So Campbell's mission statement breaks down uh, a, a mission and a vision of values, etc., into four different categories. And those are the purpose of the organization. So that's why does the organization exist? Who does it exist for? What are we trying to achieve? The strategy, so how are we going to compete? How are we going to achieve our purpose? What do we value? What does Safewell as an organization stand for? And the policies that are in place to ensure that everyone working within the organization helps to meet that purpose, strategy and values. So let's take a look at these with regards to Safewell. So we know that Safewell's mission is to provide clients with the security solutions and services that they require in order to be able to focus on their core businesses. So that's our strategy. We're competing in a range of businesses in the physical and intelligence led security, providing clients with that security solutions to allow our clients to focus on their operations. So if we're providing it for a consumer goods company, we're providing the security for that consumer goods company so that that consumer goods company can focus on producing and selling consumer goods. If our, a law firm was a client, we'd be providing security for them so they can focus on all the things that a law firm does. 
That's why we exist. That's also our strategy. We compete by providing security solutions. It also goes on to explain in our vision that our vision is to be the security industry's most trusted service provider. So that's also demonstrating how we are competing and also what we stand for. So covering both the strategy here and also the values. How we exist, why we exist is to be trustworthy, to provide security services and to be the most trustworthy provider. And we can understand how that would be so important for this industry. Because of course, if you're looking at providing security, you've got to be trustworthy. Think about something that is personal to you. Think about your home. If you were going away and you wanted someone to house sit for you while you were away, would you go up to someone on the street that you didn't know, that you have no idea whether they were trustworthy, no idea about their character and say, can you come and move into my house for two weeks and watch my house for me? No, why? Because you wouldn't trust that person to look after your house. But you might trust a good friend. You might trust your parents. You might trust, you know, someone else that you'd known for many, many years. You might trust an organization that provides house sitting services and has many years of providing house sitting services and many excellent reviews over its house sitting. But ultimately, the reason why you choose someone that you trust is because you want them to look after your house. And it's the same principle here. You wouldn't choose someone that you wouldn't trust. So being trustworthy is vital for our success. So Anything that goes against being trustworthy is something that we shouldn't do because it goes against our mission. It goes against our vision. It goes against our purpose, our strategy, our values. So everything needs to be built around being trustworthy. Never suggest anything that's going to risk our trustworthy status. I mean, think about values as well. Being innovative, being responsive, treating employees with respect and care. Again, all of these are things, are policies that are you will be expected as a senior manager working in the finance function, say, will be expected to act upon. So again, don't do anything that is not responsive to stakeholders' needs. Don't suggest anything that is going to put employees in harm's way, that is disrespecting employees. Don't do anything that's going to be seen as a regressive step and is not being innovative. Because again, those are the values of the company. So what we can see by analyzing the organization with regards to the purpose, the strategy and values, we've identified that it exists to provide security services. That's the strategy, the range of businesses it operates in as well, both physical and security. And it stands for what it values is being innovative. It values being respectful and safe. It values being trustworthy. And in long term, it wants to be the most trustworthy provider in the industry. So all of those are things that you can take forward when you are defining strategy, when you are answering questions in the exam. So that's why the organization is this, what it wants to do. That's ultimately what it wants to achieve in the long term. But how, of course, do we monitor progress towards that? Well, that's where the balanced scorecard comes in. The balanced scorecard is a great way of assessing an organization because it focuses on more than just finance. It focuses on the money, of course, because we know that is important, but it also focuses on what our customers and clients value and making sure we are continually meeting aims and goals that are built around improving customer service, improving customer response and customer attitudes towards us. Very important given that trust in our stakeholders or this trust of our stakeholders and our customers is very important. Also looks at innovations and advancements in, in the learning principle. Again, ties back to being innovative. And also our operations, our staff, staffing issues, etc. The longevity of our staff, the turnover, how satisfied they are, how much we can complete our, complete our projects on budget, on time, etc. Those are all very, very important to the operations of the company. So for financial perspective, we'd have things like profit. Of course, we, we have a reasonable profit margin at this point. The return on investment shareholders will be very interested in that, particularly if we're looking to grow into new areas, into new markets. Cash flow, very important. We have quite a lot of money in the bank at 
the moment, which is a useful thing to mention. It also helps to pepper in those pre-seen references, which are very important, what the examiner wants. If we look at the statement of financial position, we have 1,684,000,000 in the bank. That's going to help to sustain us perhaps through periods of negative cash flow, which will be very important. We look at the learning perspective. How many new services are we offering? We've got a range of different services, both in physical and intelligence led. What other services, new innovative services can we offer? What kind of new markets can we enter? Are, we know we operate in hundreds of countries around the world, 74 for physical, over 100 for intelligence led. But are there new markets we could enter? Are there new government contracts, for example, that we could offer as well? That would be providing the services we already are with new uh, buyers, new markets. Number of new innovations implemented, spending on staff training, spending on innovations, research, development. All of these are important for us as well because we want to be innovative. It's one of our uh, values is to be innovative. So we need to track that we are actually spending money, that we are actually spending money on training, spending money on new products and new services. We are implementing new innovations because that's how we track whether we're an innovative company. If we say we want to be an innovative company and then we look back and actually, oh, well, over the past five years, we've not done anything new, then are we really an innovative company? Internal perspective as well. Staffing was one of the big, big issues that came up in this precinct. There was lots of mention about treating staff fairly. There was mention of staff in the risk report. There was lots of references to the importance of recruiting and training and retaining staff throughout the pre -scene. So things such as the recruitment rates, how effective our recruitment is, how effectively we can retain staff, how satisfied our employees are, the health and safety record. We have an obligation to keep our employees safe. That was referenced multiple times in the pre scene as well. All of those are related to staff, which is a huge problem or is a huge issue for this case. And as well, the budgets of the organization, ensuring that we're operating efficiently, ensuring that we are meeting our, our success requirements. If our various different clients say that XYZ will be considered a good job on the particular client's contract, etc., ensuring that we meet that success. And to what extent, what proportion of the contracts we enter do we successfully fulfill? That would be very important as well. And our clients, how satisfied our clients will be or how satisfied they are with them, how satisfied our general stakeholders will be as well, but also the number of clients, the number of recurring clients and customers as well. It's all well and good saying, well, we, we brought in 100 new clients last year, but then in the next year, none of them came back with us. That's not going to be sustainable in the long term. We can't constantly keep going out and getting new clients. We need to retain clients. We need to have that repeat business, particularly given that a lot of our clients are likely to be far larger scale organizations. There isn't going to be a never ending pool of potential customers, it's not like with individual consumers, etc., where if certain consumers don't come back, you've still got a billion more to market to, etc. So all of those very important, all of those need to have measures in place to monitor them effectively to ensure that we are meeting our goals. We are taking steps towards meeting our goals. We are casting the net a little bit wider now with a look at the wider industry in which the pre-scene company operates with our industry analysis video. It is critical to demonstrate to the examiner that you have fully understood the pre-scene industry as a key element to gaining extra high marks in your case study exam. Researching the industry can be a laborious process, especially when you're not sure which information is useful and which isn't. And our team has spent hours doing this research for you, finding the information that will help you to achieve a wider perspective of the industry and build a deeper knowledge in preparation for your exam. So in this next clip, we'll be taking a look at our industry analysis video. It may come as no surprise to you all that to find the origins of the private security industry, we go back to the British Empire. I'd like to mention the East India Company as a significant organization within this. What we need to be thinking about here is assets. The commodities that the East India Company traded in here were hugely valuable at the time. And to protect them, the East India Company established a private army. 
This was significant in safeguarding its operations, in particular those responsible for creating revenue. Building on this point further, the Industrial Revolution acted as a catalyst for the development of the modern-day security industry as we know it today. During this period, the embryonic companies of the previous two centuries developed into more closely related organisations to what we see today, and as a result, security companies became engaged in offering protective services for their assets. What's more, we see the link between private security and the empire during the Crimean War, and then after that, we see operations begin to develop in the 1930s, as security companies began to innovate and diversify their offerings in response to what? Developing technologies. Industrial espionage became a huge factor in shaping the operations of private security firms, and they started to incorporate more intelligence-led services that were designed to identify and mitigate the risks posed by these developments. This naturally necessitated a more skilled workforce, and we see the transition of the security industry away from what we might refer to a more militaristic practice to being information and technology led. Significantly, this allowed security firms to employ a comprehensive approach to both deterrence and response. Rather than reacting to threats and risks, security services looked to tackle them at their sources and use the information technology to do so. Today, the security industry is a complex amalgam of traditional practices and cutting-edge innovations. Private security firms continue to leverage emerging technologies to adapt, and there is an increasing necessity for integrated security solutions that involve both physical services, technology, and risk management to protect digital infrastructures and assets, as well as intellectual properties. So, let's have a little look at what this looks like as an industry life cycle. The first stage, the introduction phase, as we've seen, refers to the embryonic companies of the 17th century involved in the protection of high-value individuals or assets. After World War II, there was a significant uptick in the demand for security solutions. This was a result of the technological innovations that came from the war itself, as nations looked to gain advantages over one another through communication and information. We see this manifest in electronic surveillance, advanced tools for communication like radios, and risk assessment services in the period following World War II. And then, as we transition into the late 20th century and early 21st century, we see security firms begin to cater to both domestic and international markets. By doing so, they had to adhere to special industry security requirements. This includes not only tailoring solutions to the risks that are associated with specific industries, but also adhering to the increased corporate governance, stakeholder expectations, intellectual property protection, regulatory legislation and guidelines, all of the structure that business has begun to exist within. In terms of decline, it may surprise you that the security service industry still appears to be growing. This is due to the immense development of technology, presenting new risks all the time. Companies continue to blend tradition with innovation, but now what we're starting to see is a trend towards enterprise risk management. What is enterprise risk management? Well, it's a key strategic discipline in the industry. It provides a comprehensive framework for identifying, assessing, managing, and monitoring risks across organizations. We'll have a little look again at this in a little bit. So don't fret too much if that's not making any sense right now. As well as this, we've seen a significant focus on sustainable and ethical practices as companies and clients both look to safeguard their operations for the future, gain tax cuts through emissions cutting, and adhere to the expectations of society more generally in terms of the ethical and sustainable practices they take. 
In summary, the timeline of the private security services industry reflects the continuous need to adapt to new threats and risks presented by technological developments, whilst maintaining and updating pre-existing traditional practices. And as the application to the print scene states here, we see SafeWorld's transformation as reflecting misdevelopment in general. Now, let's move on to have a little look at some of the services provided in the security industry. Firstly, I'd like to start with on-site guarding, which is exactly what you'd expect. Staffing reception desks, patrolling clients' premises and deterring and detecting intruders, providing security staff for retail shops. It is important to note that while security services are responsible for criminal activity that happens under their watch, they do not have law enforcement powers and therefore must report it to the police. Moving on now to mobile guarding, which involves using vehicles to patrol client premises at random intervals. Security guards also check that doors are locked and there's no signs of force entry, as well as checking in over the radio when they can. Other remote services include electronic security systems, which can be monitored from control rooms. And these receive any notifications of intrusions, which allows staff to respond to alarms by notifying the police and the relevant parties inside the organization they are protecting. Furthermore, corporate investigations, which can include a number of different kinds, such as counter espionage, fraud investigations, and vetting potential appointees for managerial positions. All of these are very important to maintaining the integrity of internal operations and the safety of company culture. Beyond this, we see risk management in general as an offering, and once again, we can't escape it, but enterprise risk management. And it's here I'd like to offer you a more comprehensive definition. Enterprise risk management is a strategy designed to manage the combined impact of financial, operational, and or compliance risks by aligning risk management practices with organizational goals and strategies. What this means is creating a more comprehensive and holistic approach to solving problems and mitigating risks, which is in line with the general practice and direction and culture of the company itself. Naturally, a significant part of this is going to be security assessment, evaluating existing physical and cyber security systems to update them and explore any potential breaches and weaknesses that may be there. And of course, we can't forget training, which is an essential provision for management and staff, particularly for mitigating against human errors that can occur from working from home or accidentally revealing sensitive information. In terms of recent developments, i.e. new products and innovations, as we continue to see, they are linked intrinsically to the life cycle of the private security industry through technological development. So, the emerging technologies we've already begun to discuss, like AI, can be used to enable faster, more accurate analysis of potential threats and enhance overall security efficiency. Security companies aim to do this by amalgamating new practices and technologies such as fraud integrated security solutions and also cybersecurity innovations into customized and adaptable security plans that are tailored to the specific needs, strategies of a business and the risks associated with the industry in which it operates. We've had a look at the past and the present, so let's use research and development as a tool to look towards the future. R&D is crucial in allowing private security firms to stand out in the market and better satisfy stakeholders. In particular, we should be looking towards preventative measures as companies look to prevent losses before they even happen, rather than just reacting to them in general. There's a few things we've already spoken about here on this list, but I'd like to mention in particular collaborative security initiatives. This is a trend that we've seen increasingly develop as firms have realized that collaborating with others allows them to exchange information, use the correct technology and take advantage of each other's specializations. Of course, this must be done within the bounds of the law and with adherence to the best practice and the ethical and moral obligations of businesses. 
if we're thinking about applying this general information more specifically to the pre-scene, we may look at how Safewell can use research and development to advance the services it offers in areas such as cybersecurity and risk management by innovating through technology and defense systems. The next clip is taken from one of our most popular videos, the top 10 issues. The top 10 issues video identifies the 10 most likely issues to appear in the exam based on our expertise and experience in this area. And our expert gives guidance on how to deal with the issues in your answers, provides advice on which models to use and key points that you should raise. Based on our experience of analysing SEMA case studies for over 10 years, our predictions have been extremely accurate in previous exams, with around 70 to 80% of topics in the real exams being covered in our top 10 lists. So take a look now at this clip from our top 10 issues video. And we're going to kick off with, as you would expect, number 10. And number 10 is funding. And the reason why I've put this in, the reason why I put it as number 10 as well, is because it's not likely to be a major issue. It's not likely to be something that is going to have a whole question or at least subsection tied to it. It's one of these questions or one of these topics that just appears in some way, shape or form every single time. It's commonly examined. It is used as part of other questions. It's an add-on issue. It's not likely to be a question in its own right, but there might be a question about an acquisition. There might be a question about a new opportunity. There might be a question about expanding into a new area, a question about uh, offering a new service, for example. All of these things are more likely to be major topics in their own right, but all of them require funding. And funding also ties in with general working capital. Funding ties in with paying salaries for the hundreds of thousands of employees that we have here at Safewell. It's also a key part of your role. The guide that SEMA gave you, the preamble for the role that you're playing in this exam, sourcing funding, sourcing finance was a key part of it. So it's for all those reasons, it's one of these things that will come up as an add-on issue or something that you will need to make sure you mention about because it's part of your role when answering questions. So likely issues for funding could be that there is some big long term funding requirements that we're undertaking an acquisition, that we're entering a new market, that we've got lots of new projects that we want to undertake. And all of this is going to require hundreds of millions, if not billions of Barlin dollars in investment. So we need to make sure that we have the money available for this, whilst also simultaneously being able to take care of our short term working capital. Now we have over 1.6 billion in the bank at the moment, but then we have trade payables that are in the billions as well. We have salaries that are going to be in the hundreds of millions if not billions. Remember, we've got almost half a million employees that we know of. We might have even more. That was just the security personnel and the consultants. Before mentioning anyone else that's involved with the business, before mentioning any of the head office type roles within the business, the marketing, the human resources, finance departments, etc. So a huge amount of stuff that will need salaries. And of course, you can't just say, oh, we'll pay you next month. They need to be paid every month. They'll have rent, they'll have mortgages, etc. that need to be paid from those salaries. And that's especially important for an organization like this because the, the report provided to us, the risk report provided, said that there were very complex contracts that sometimes they will perhaps, you know, be, you know, we're investing a lot of money into a contract long before we actually get paid for the services we're providing. They're very complex contracts. So we're exposed to contract risk as well, which increases the risk of uh, short term working capital risk, it increases the uh, negative cash flow risk. So having enough funding to pay for our working capital, pay for our salaries, etc., is going to be critical. And some key points to raise, and you'll be pleased to know that just referencing figures given to us in the pre-scene are going to count as pre-scene information, showing we are using, understanding the pre-scene information, and we're using it as part of our answers. So key points to bring up here is yes, we have got 1 billion 684 million Barlin dollars in the bank, but please don't say, oh, of course we can invest in this project that's $1.6 billion. We've got it. 
But do we have it? Remember our trade payables, what if these all fall to? They're already at nearly three billion. What about our working capital requirements? What about those hundreds of thousands of employees that have salaries that need paid for? Cash flow budgeting is going to be critical. Negative cash flows must be planned for and having a reasonable amount of money in the bank as a contingency is an important part of planning for that. We also have reasonably low or medium levels of debt running through the organization. I've got the two gearing figures there for 2023. Some, or one of them, the uh, 66.13 is at long-term debt over equity. 39.82, that's long-term debt over long-term debt plus equity. There's no right or wrong answer necessarily. You can use either of them in your exam, but just explain which one you've used and always make sure you're using the same one. You don't want to be comparing last year's using long-term debt over equity with this year's using long-term debt over long-term debt plus equity, for example. And so that's a useful figure to bring up. Also an important figure is our interest cover. It's almost 13.5, meaning we can pay our finance costs 13.5 times over with our operating profit. So a small increase in the debts that we borrow, a small increase in our finance costs is not going to be dramatic to our bottom line. So that's important figures to bring up when you're talking about potential debt funding. We've also got a reasonable amount of assets in, uh, as well. We've got tangible assets of uh, 1 billion 337 million, and that can be used as security to raise debt against as well. And some relevant theories to bring up here, the advantage of debt versus equity and vice versa. So for example, if we take on additional debt, it gives us very quick access, it's very low cost. Whereas equity, very, very expensive and time consuming to raise money through equity. We can do it, of course, as a publicly traded company, but it's usually for huge amounts of funding. But we're talking about raising billions to, to go on huge projects, not just, oh, we want to raise uh, an extra you know, few thousand to, to purchase a new machine or to, to purchase a new building, for example, a small building. You wouldn't raise equity funding there. But on the other hand, dividends are optional, unlike interest payments. So it does mean you don't necessarily have to pay back the capital. And also another important theory to remember is Mendlow's there, where your lenders, where your equity providers would be in your Mendlow's matrix. Big, important institutional shareholders, for example, likely to be key players and banks likely to be a keep satisfied as well. So both have high power, high impact on your business operations, on your strategy. So that's issue number 10. Now on to issue number nine, acquisitions. Again, another key topic, something that is regularly tested in the exam. And it's also because it's a very easy question for the examiner to ask. And it tests a huge range. It links with funding, it links with risk, it links with competitors, it links with strategy, it links with analyzing a strategy, etc. It's a very, very easy question to write about. It's also linked to the industry itself. When we consider that there's only a few companies, big companies in this, and it could be very difficult to find that competitive advantage. So you might find, for example, that competitors are working together or competitors are buying other competitors to try and become a larger company. It could also be that we need to grow, we need to diversify our service offerings in order to compete and therefore we need to acquire a company. For example, we know that Growbar Industries is the biggest company in the world in this field. But what makes them the biggest is the fact that they also have facilities management, for example. So what if we want to try and expand the facilities management? It's not a core competence of ours. It's not something we have expertise in. So maybe we want to purchase a smaller facilities management company and then start scaling that up to work alongside us in our service offerings so that we can compete more directly, more competitively with Growbar Industries. But of course, there are other problems with acquisitions as well. Integration is a huge issue with acquisitions. Integrating a company onto your IT systems, integrating a company into your HR systems, into your cultural system, it's a huge undertaking. And often if it's not done well with effective change management, the 
costs of an acquisition often end up outweighing any potential benefits that can come from it, particularly if those aren't realized because of problems with integration. So some key points to bring up are, of course, the benefits of it. It is a good method. It's a quick method of growth. It's also generally a lower risk method of growth in one way. It's a high risk in terms of the risks involved of it, in terms of the cost involved in it, but it's often a lower risk, particularly if it's a new area that you do not have expertise in. Because if we were to purchase, say, for example, a smaller or Barland based, but nationwide providing facilities management company, the risk of us not making a success of it is reduced because we're purchasing a company that has a brand name. We're purchasing a company that is already successful in that field rather than the Safewell name, which is not affiliated with facilities management at all. And we have no experience doing it, trying to do it ourselves. So also the, the type of integration it is, whether it's horizontal, purchasing a competitor, vertical, purchasing a supplier, a client, conglomerate, a completely different uh, organization, a completely different industry altogether. Those are the different uh, types of integration. Those are the different types of acquisitions that you could mention. Also, the business valuations is an important part of it. How are you going to effectively value the business that you're purchasing, testing that key F3 knowledge? So that's one of the theories that you might bring up. The, the various different types of earnings base, asset based, etc. Asset base unlikely to be very useful in an organization if we're like this when we're purchasing competitors, for example, because we're not an asset heavy organization. We're not like a construction company, for example, where a huge amount of the value of the business is in the physical assets that it has. It's very much a consultancy based system, services based system. We don't have that much assets versus the actual revenue we generate. A lot of our value comes from our knowledge, comes from our services, etc. But there are advantages, of course, of acquisitions. It does mean that you can purchase, a, you can basically buy more market share quite quickly. You're purchasing knowledge. It's also quite quick. Now, the acquisition itself might take a while to go through, but as soon as it goes through, you've suddenly got years and years of knowledge, years and years of market share that's just suddenly integrated into your business. But of course, there are risks and problems that come with that, such as failure to do due diligence correctly, failure to integrate the business and good change management is a vital part of doing that, ensuring that an acquisition is a success. Our final clip is from our mini mock debrief video. We produce a range of mock exams for each sitting and alongside each of those mocks is a video debrief. And in these debrief videos, our experienced tutor analyzes every question and takes you through a step-by-step -step guide on the best way to approach them. And by watching debrief videos, you'll learn to understand how to pick out all of the key information in the task and the requirements. You'll use that information to build an effective plan. Many students fail due to poor answer planning, and then that will help you to formulate an excellent answer. So in our sample video, tutor will take you through question one of the mini mock. What you might do is get an email like this. And the first thing that I always recommend anyone taking these mock exams, anyone taking the actual SEMA strategic exam, etc. The first thing you need to do is to look at the requirement line and understand how much is required of you? How many marks are required for each of the particular subtasks? And the reason why I suggest this is because if you start looking through the script in a very linear fashion, you start speculating, you start analyzing what could come up. Whereas if you go straight to the requirement line, you know what you're looking for. It narrows down exactly what you're trying to do. Then when you go back and you start analyzing the rest of the text, you know what you're looking for. You know you're looking for points that are going to help you answer this specific question. Now, of course, this is a mini mock. It's quite a small one, but in the actual exam, in your actual mocks, you might have much larger bodies of text as well. So there's much more scope for there to be 
information that's not actually relevant necessarily for answering the question or is only useful in a very specific way for answering the question. So let's take a look at our requirement lines. You can see here in this email from Sabine, the CFO, that we've got to produce an evaluation of the viability of a proposed project on the assumption that we use a cost of capital of 8%. That's our usual one. And we've got to recommend a way to move forward with this project, including the justification and key strategic actions for us. So already just looking at those two requirement lines, we've got a lot of information that we can use to start preparing a structure for this answer. Before we even looked at any of the information, before we even know what this project is about or anything like that, we know that we have a structure in place. We've got to evaluate the viability of a proposed project. We've then got to uh, create a recommendation with justifications and key strategic actions. So the best model for using to structure your answers in the exam when you've got to analyze a project, a new market, a new service, an acquisition, whatever it may be, is the suitability, acceptability, feasibility model. This is great because it helps structure your answer. It also gives you lots of jumping off points for the sorts of things that you might bring up. We know that under suitability, you get suitability emissions, suitability values, acceptability to your shareholders, to your employees, feasibility, do you have the knowledge? Do you have the resources, the funding for it? And then we've also been given the specific breakdown of the second subtask there, with the recommendation, the justifications, and the action points. So as you can see on the screen, I've put a brief structure there. The next thing we need to do is look at the breakdown of the marks. I can see that this is 64, so it's relatively even split, but certain questions you might have a lot more of a split. You might have a subtask that is 70% and a subtask that's 30%, for example. And that's really important that you break that down because this percentage that is given to you and they started giving it to learners since the the update, the SEMA update for the syllabus in 2020, before they didn't actually give you this breakdown. And it helps to identify how much time and marks are available. So rather than spending 50% of your time on each of these, you know you need to spend 60% on subtask A and 40% on subtask B. That's because it is broken down by that in the mark scheme. So in your actual exam, a question might be worth around about 33 to 34 marks because, of course, there's three questions and it's originally marked out of 100 before being uh, used under the scaled score, which is out of 150. But this is a mini mock, so we'll halve it to around about 17 marks. And we can split that 60% and 40%. It's roughly 10 marks for subtask A and it's the remaining seven marks for subtask B. And it's important that we do this because we know that there are more marks to gain from subtask A. So we shouldn't split our time even if we tried to say write around about seven to eight marks for each of these, we'd be missing out on marks because we wouldn't be writing enough to try to get the maximum amount of marks for the first part. And uh, we could end up writing more marks than we need for subtask B, and those aren't going to be carried back to subtask A. So it's important that you break it down like this. And what you should already be able to see is that we're already looking at how we can allocate marks to our structure. So we've got 10 marks. That's not actually that many. That's particularly given that we've already got a structure for subtask A of suitability, acceptability, feasibility. That's just three to four marks for one of these and three marks for the others. And we'll have written 10 marks worth of content. Same for subtask B. Maybe give ourselves a mark for the recommendation, then we write about three or four for justification and three, four action points. And suddenly we're on course for a 100% answer. So now that we have analyzed the requirement lines, we have started to bring up a structure. We can return to the unseen, we can return to the reference material, etc., and start pulling together points to raise in our structure. 
now that we know what we're looking for. So the board has identified a potential acquisition opportunity in Forensex, financial consultancy business with a reputation for forensic accounting and one that shares many of Safewell's values. So essentially we're looking at an acquisition opportunity. That's the project that we're analyzing here. Looking at forensic accounting, it's one that shares values with Safewell. So initially what we need to be thinking of here is it's forensic accounting. We know that there is demand for that. It was mentioned in the precinct. Also do bring up the, the precinct articles there. We know that the sorts of well, things forensic accounting falls under corporate investigations. We know that's a service that we already provide. And so for it, therefore, we could be selling this particular product forensic accounting service once we've acquired the company to our existing uh, customers, which would then mean that it was a medium risk strategy because it's essentially it's a, uh, a new service to our existing customers. So that's to do with its suitability. It ties in with what we're currently doing, ties in with our current clients, and one that shares many of Safewell's values. So again, suitability to us, suitability to our mission, our vision, our values. They share values of ours. So again, more evidence as to why it is suitable. And this is in response to a report from the newly created Industry Insight Unit. Please see the attached report along with the forecast cost of the project and a news article profiling the company. So let's look at the reference material. Just as an aside here, SEMA does expect you to use the reference material. If they've given it to you, they expect you to, to use it to help formulate your responses. So the Insight Unit has taken a survey into trends and demands. A key finding was the increased demand for corporate investigations into fraud and the fair value of losses caused by operational disruptions, misrepresentation and negligent advice. All of the things that forensic accountants look for. Many of Barlin's largest corporations have reported an increase in the need for forensic accounting, both for launching and defending lawsuits. As such, accounting firms with trained forensic accountants, particularly those capable of providing litigation support, that's again a nod to the article given in the pre-scene, have been able to charge a premium. So again, more reason why we should perhaps enter the market. It's very profitable, very lucrative at the moment. Options for corporations remain limited with only a few small to medium providers or large accounting firms able to provide these services. None of the major security services have thus far entered this market. So we're going to recommend either partnering or acquiring an appropriate and established going concern that specializes in forensic accounting. Now, when it says here, we recommend partnering or acquiring, but then it talks about an acquisition in uh, the uh, question what we can say here is that when you're talking about potential options alternative options that maybe you could recommend if you feel that the acquisition is going to be too expensive or anything like that that you could recommend instead of acquiring that we partner with that we work together that we undertake a joint venture or whatever it might be with an existing provider it would also allow us to diversify our service offering and allow us to have more of a competitive advantage. So what we need to think about, if you think about the plan that we've created is the knowledge there. Do we have the knowledge? We have some of the knowledge. We do work in investigations. We do work in intelligence led security. We do work in corporate investigations, but perhaps not specifically in forensic accounting. So we might need to gain that knowledge, but then if we do purchase the company, we're acquiring that knowledge as part of it. With regards to acceptability to our various different stakeholders, clients are unlikely to be happy, unhappy about this if it means we've got more services that they desire. Shareholders aren't going to be happy if it makes money, which we can see that according to the analysis of the proposed acquisition, it will, it will have a net present value of uh, 78 million Barlin dollars. And employees perhaps aren't going to be unhappy either because it's not necessarily going to affect them. We're not going to need to make redundancies, etc. However, for head office staff, particularly if we integrate the companies, people working in IT and HR and those more head office functions, there might be some duplication of efforts there. So there might be a risk to staff in those fields. So again, those are important points to bring up. 
One thing I will say is that it did mention that we use our regular cost of capital in order to discount the uh, cash flows. Now, the problem with that is that if it was an existing operations, it was a project, a new project that was very much in the same area of something that we've always done before, then perhaps it would be appropriate. But acquisitions are always difficult. There's always problems with integration, etc. It's a perhaps a service that we may not be complete experts in, etc. And as a result, sometimes trying to use the usual cost of capital is not appropriate. You need to use a higher rate to take into account the uh, higher risk involved. And we know that it is a medium risk strategy, whereas your usual one would be maybe for lower risk strategies. Also, it's the fact that it's going to cost 240 million Barlin dollars. Now we have 1.6 billion in the bank, so that may sound like we've got more than enough. But of course, remember that a lot of the, the cash that we have will be for working capital, our trade payables already almost 3 billion, for example. We've also got working capital requirements, salaries, negative cash flows to budget for as well. So quite a lot of points that we can bring out here. The last thing we're going to look at before going over to our plan is a company profile of Forensex. You can see that they are a fairly established company have been around for over 30 years, located in East Barland City, but they do serve Barland nationwide. And also given the, the size of us, the size of Safewell, we can scale up those operations as well. Currently got 620 employees, including 460 accountants and 134 head office staff working in central functions. Their primary customers are the same customers that we currently have, publicly traded larger organizations. And to put trust at the heart of everything we do and to change with the times are the key takeaways from their values. Of course, it's very much similar to us. Our vision is to be the most trustworthy security provider. And uh, to, to change the times, it's like to be responsive, to be innovative. It's also values of us as a company. So there we have it, five key videos to get you started with your exam preparation. I hope you found them useful, but the reality is that this is just a starting point and you'll need to do a lot more preparation over the next few weeks to improve your chances of passing this tricky exam. And to that end, we have a number of options available. The video clips you've just seen are taken from our course content. Now courses are designed to help you ultimately pass the exam. We want to minimize your study time. And of course, we want to ensure that you're getting your value for your money. So if you want more of what you saw today, you want to check out our full pre-scene analysis pack. And that basically includes the full videos from which those clips were taken from the pre-scene analysis videos through to the top 10 analysis, the strategic analysis, industry analysis. And in addition to that, we've also got 30 pre-seen questions that are designed to help you consolidate your knowledge and understanding of the pre-seen company. Pre-seen analysis is a crucial first step, but passing the exam requires developing your exam technique and lots and lots of practice. So the best all round comprehensive solution is the Astranti premium course. On that, in addition to everything you get in the pre-seen analysis pack, you'll also get five mock exams. And those mock exams are written according to the pre-seen company. They're not generic and they don't have generic solutions. They're applied to the pre-seen and they're based on the top 10 issues. So you'll get questions in the mock exam that they'll have a good chance of coming up in the real exam. In addition to those mock exams, you can get mock marking and feedback. And this is where you'll submit a mock exam to your dedicated marker and they will mark that and give you a fully annotated script with feedback and annotations. And they also provide a nine page document with feedback that you can apply in your next mock. 
In addition to that, we've got our exam technique video series. Exam technique is really important in this exam. And so our exam technique video series has 13 chapter study texts and accompanying videos taking you through every aspect of exam technique, right from understanding the exam through to interpreting the requirements, answer planning, writing technique, and time management. Really valuable course that will help you a lot developing those soft skills that you need to do well in this exam. Alongside that, we have three live masterclasses that run throughout the course, from the first one that's looking at the pre-scene through to later ones that look more at exam technique and theory revision to help you get ready. Included in the premium, you get access to tutor and mentor support, and you'll be able to access our discussion hub where you can post your questions and talk with other students and tutors about any questions and queries you may have. And our premium course comes with our double pass guarantee, and that's exclusive to premium course students. It's a double guarantee because if you don't pass, if you take this course and you don't pass the exam, We'll give it you again for free with no extra charge and you also have a 14 day money back guarantee so if after 14 days on the course you're not happy you can get a refund no questions asked so whatever your situation we believe we have the solution for you at astranti and you can find out more at astranti.com sema thanks for watching